Morning all. I've got a very interesting Magnus Carlsen game here from 2006 against one of my favourite grandmasters, John Nunn, one of the strongest uh, grandmasters ever in the UK, in England. Here in 2006, 26th of August 2006 to be precise, Magnus was already rated 2675. Um, so he's uh, not that old <laughs> at this time. Born in November 90, so that makes him about um, 15 years old at the time of this game. Against the very experienced uh, Grandmaster John Nunn, that's why it's called Experience versus Rising Stars. Um, so it was a, a Shaven England team match. Okay, and um, Magnus played against John Nunn e4. John replied with a Sicilian defence. After knight f3, d6. We head for actually a Nidorf, Sicilian Nidorf, a6 here. After bishop e3, not, not this Schwenigen, Schaveningen transposition, but e5. Now e5 does come at a slight cost uh, for the d5 square. And probably you'll be quite impressed by this game for as a demonstration of the d5 square and the backward pawn here, which usually... Um, you would consider not severe weaknesses because they're not that exploitable. If they are exploitable with, with white getting a nice piece on d5, it's not all over. Black can often generate counterplay. On this channel, we've seen you know, Grandmaster Daniel King um, going over some of his games. That was a beautiful um, set of games in that dual commentary video, if you'd like to find that for the Nidorf. But this, this shows a dark side of the Nidorf, this game example. So Bishop e7. And nothing to flash here from white. Bishop c4. Okay. Uh, which does I d5 and this diagonal in general. Both sides castle, king side, bishop e6, and the bishop just drops back to b3. And you might think, you know, when black takes here, you, you might think a takes is, is a logical thing, capture towards the center. Just bear that in mind uh, for a moment. Knight c6, and we see the move queen e2, which is uh, a logical place for the queen. You know, maybe there's a potential threat of taking and then queen c4 to get back on that diagonal and attack e6, or just, you know, make way for the rook uh, with some potential threats of knight e5 if black's not careful because of the queen on d8. So, anyway, black plays knight a5, and now we see rook fd1. And now knight takes b3 is played. So, this looks like a routine capture, surely. You just play a takes b3 here. Would you? <laughs> How many of you would consider c takes b3? Now, if I give you 10 seconds, I'm going to say it's c takes b3, but can you visualize an important knight maneuver based on d5? if c takes b3 is significant. So I'm going to give you a clue. I want you to not to guess the next move or anything, just the knight manoeuvre, which c takes b3 creates as a possibility. It's very, very interesting, I think. Okay, a little bit of a positional test. Well, actually, c takes b3 is, is played, and the knight manoeuvre is like this, <laughs> believe it or not. If white can create a bind with the d5 square. That's going to be quite painful for black, especially this bishop locked in, imprisoned, with its own pawn structure, that pawn on d6. For the moment, white is also pressing, by the way, knight takes e5 of that knight on f3. John does something about that. He moves his queen away to e8. So knight takes e5 is no longer threatened. Knight e1. And then we see this knight maneuver process in action. Knight c2, and the queen now goes back to d7. Of course, the knight's not threatening e5 or anything. Knight b4, and oh dear, is this going to be an uncomfortable game for black? Rook fc8, and we see f3 supporting e4 for a moment. There might have been an exchange sack or something, maybe. 
but uh, this is reinforced and d5 is under white's control here. The bishop is not completely dead on e7, it tries to reroute now. Bishop d8, maybe it's useful along this diagonal potentially. Rook d3, preparing to pile up on d6, which would be a sort of punishment for the bishop leaving the defensive position on e7. We see a5, and the knight is forced to take it. Well, not necessarily forced to take, but it looks logical to take that square d5. Now black takes and white takes, and the key thing here is for white to preserve a peace outpost on d5, not use a pawn. Unless in, in special circumstances, sometimes taking the pawn's good for this diagonal, but not in this position. Keeping keep, keeping that peace outpost is a key thing. It looks as though visually, you know, black hasn't got much counterplay actually. And um, I think there's a big recurring question in chess, at least at least for me, about strategy versus tactics. And you can always consider like logic to be sort of st strategy, because logically, what is going on here? Logically, black has a backward pawn, um, not such a good bishop. The logic of the position dictates that white's better, even if we didn't calculate millions of variations like a computer to find all the finesses, the logic would dictate that white is better. Um, if, if we're going to uh, look at for tons of finesses, that might change the picture somehow, but maybe not here because, well, white's king is kind of safe. Black really hasn't got many tactical threats going on, many forcing moves or, or sources of tactical counterplay, not at the moment. Anyway, but um, John tries to liberate the rook here now with a4. White just takes that and plays b3, kicking the rook back. Of course, white's undoubled the pawns, but black wanted to get an active rook. That's a bit of a cost of that to undouble white's pawns. And now rook ad1 is played. Okay, and we see the move rook a5, a bit of a change of mind maybe. We'll look at this in the second pass if, if black had better here than the rook a5. Uh, this does create a slight weakness of the last move actually, that b6 square. But you might not think Magnus is interested in using that with the knight because that knight's kind of beautiful there. But in fact Magnus does, he plays knight b6, forking rook and queen, basically extracting the dark square bishop which still leaves you know d6 weak bishop takes b6 bishop takes b6 and after you know after rook a6 white is winning a pawn so a pawn up but you might think well opposite color bishops does this matter too much we'll see queen e7 now this is a nifty move as are most of Magnus's moves queen b2 putting pressure on e5 and queen g5 shifts into gear for, for white's king a little bit, as if there might be something going on on the king side here. a4 preparing to secure the knight, freeing up the rook. h5, as though this, this might start to be dangerous for the white king. a5, h4. Okay, Magnus just ignores the the frets in the vertical commas of, of, of h3. He just plays b4, getting the pawn off the scope of the, the bishop. So um, now it's starting to look quite troublesome for black as well because of b5 as well. Rook goes back. And now we get queen d2. And John didn't refuse the exchange of queens here. If he does refuse the exchange of queens, I think it could get quite nasty. Uh, for example, just just intuitively, I think if queen f6, there might be bishop d8, skewering queen and pawn here. This might be possible. We'll check in the second pass. That looks like a good move. Um, if queen g6, well, again, d8 might be a problem. Or this pin might be annoying. So John just takes on d2, maybe hoping the opposite kind of bishops are going to help black here. Rook 1 takes d2, and we see rook c4. Is that a bit of counterplay for black against this b4 pawn? It's simply protected with bishop c5. Now bishop, pardon me, rook c8, and now b7 
is targeted rook b6 defending rook c7 king steps in king h7 and now e5 is targeted with bishop d6 is that winning yet another pawn now well not quite rook d7 pinning the rook to d2 is this a problem for white not really because the king's now on f2 it can help in all the tactics with king e3 protecting the rook now renewing the threat of bishop takes e5 so f6 is that a big deal well there's a slight weakness of the last move this e6 is now a loose piece and that's exploited I hope you can see it bishop takes e5 unveiling an attack on the bishop so another pawn has bitten the dust and it's no longer opposite colored bishops unfortunately is this rook and pawn ending salvageable rook takes king takes rook takes b4 but rook takes e5 keeps white being uh, two pawns up you might think well there's check winning this pawn but again now here Magnus plays check and he's still two pawns up here after rook a2 king b4 actually John Nunn's had enough here okay John Nunn at the time of this game 2617 very experienced GM Magnus already uh, 2675 so remember at the start of the year Magnus had broken records junior records for the first um, the youngest person to break the 2600 elo barrier at the start of the year and this is now in August um, and he's played a game like this where it seems actually to me that black didn't have much counterplay it's it's quite incredible and the dark side of uh, the the Nidorf was really exposed um, with with kind of simple uh, logical should we say logical uh, chess uh, based on the d5 square but you know a seemingly paradoxical uh, decision of, of capturing away from the center actually facilitates this key knight maneuver uh, in fact if you, if you look at an opportunity for, for that knight maneuver or anything to do with um, d5 on a takes b3 it would seem to take ages to get a relevant knight maneuver surely to d5 uh, we might consider I suppose something like this but you have to move this out of the way or maybe this this route pardon me this route c4 to b6 on the other hand blacks maybe gonna put a rook there to discourage any knight maneuver like that I I guess you know it, it is possible to still use uh, d5 but this seems to be a fast route c takes b3 for achieving that operation um, so Queen e8 to get out of the way of e5 oh sorry and we'll, we'll check with an engine really sorry this was the supposedly the second pass we're, we're out of theory uh, so we're going to check more clinically with an engine white did have a small advantage here and you know what what does actually the en our engine friend think it actually gives c takes b3 as the top candidate there then it switched its mind to a takes b3 but C takes B3 is still lurking, so that's that's quite interesting. But White not apparently having much of an advantage. This is this is sort of what I read yesterday, where engines are kind of stumbling around, kind of in the dark, uh, without really seeing the logic of the position. The logic of the position, you know, underpins lots of the variations that Black has this backward D6 pawn and a hole on D5, so. We can we can see the crystal clear logic. The engines can can see all the finesses and all the technical stuff, but the actual logic of the position here is is that black, from a human perspective, didn't seem to have uh, much counterplay uh, because you know of the fixed pawn structure and and d6 and d5 issue. Um, it's only when it's made much more obvious here with this knight maneuver the culmination of this knight maneuver that I guess the evaluation uh, starts jumping up for white here because at the moment it looks as though it's equal unless John Nunn really really misplayed it but it's it's it looks like a difficult position and now it's it's even as if black slightly better after a5 which John played why why is this the case you might ask um, is, is this like is this 
variations defying uh, the intuitive logic that we can just plainly see here. Well, I guess, f first of all, I mean, engines might weight the two bishops highly, not factoring in compatibility too much with pawn structure. So if nothing else, but I suppose f5 might be a useful resource here. So possibly the engine can prove the bishops are useful. It's it's very interesting. If there's persistent pressure on e4, maybe that's that's better than the game. Could this actually be in this example uh, be made useful? I mean, e4 could be more exposed here in this line. Um, this this sort of looks a lot better than the game. So anyway, Magnus is not playing against the computer. So John just played a4. And after taking, okay, white's pawns are undoubled, but black still technically looking okay at this stage. So is this a key blunder? What happens here? Rook a5. I guess it is a key blunder, and probably unexpected because because visually we'd all be thinking this is a great knight on d5, and why, why would white want to uh, translate that knight into anything else? But this does translate into a clear advantage. But then again, this is the thing, you know, logically we thought white was better anyway. And what that really means is if you're playing another human, it's going to be more difficult for them to keep playing accurately. If you're playing computer, computer doesn't care if it has to play at this level of accuracy all the time with a minus 0 0.16, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So actually, it's, it's actually slightly better for black, technically, and the computer doesn't care at all about the difficulty of playing the position. It just so happens here is a blunder. Rook a5, uh, because of that intuitively nice knight, it actually does do damage with knight b6. Uh, we're getting a double attack basically on a5 and d6, winning a pawn. And white is now better after winning this pawn. And so black's structure is now under fire with queen b2. And things get worse. Um, rook d8 apparently here is is good, um, better than the game. But queen d2 looks a uh, simple and clear cut idea after safeguarding the pawn. Uh, queen d2 even immediately I think was mentioned by the engine, but um, but now queen d2 is is a strong move as well. Just just taking off the queens, and um, now you know white is preparing uh, to go again for e5 potentially. Rook c7 probably didn't help Black's cause, or did it? I mean, he had to defend b7. If Rook b8, there's, I guess, a6 or something, or just Bishop d6 here for b7. So it's very, it's, it's, it's looking lost now, the position. It's actually looking lost. Um, so Black is um, winning another, is losing another pawn rather, with Bishop takes e5 being played by White here. Uh, even though there might be even more incisive moves apparently, but uh, in this continuation, this rook and pawn ending is just um, two pawns down. Okay, um, I hope you got something from that. It just shows that um, Magnus was even, you know, in 2006, he was able to just uh, cut to cut out the counterplay of very dangerous, experienced grandmasters. He did get the board prize in this tournament, this experience versus Rising Stars um, team match uh, tournament, and the, ex the Rising Stars won the match 22-28. <clears throat> Colson achieved the best individual score, 6.5 out of 10, 2700 ELO. <clears throat> okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.